All right, Psalm chapter 20 is for the choir director, a Psalm of David. And many believe while heading off to war, King David stopped to pray in the sanctuary and was joined by the congregation as they interceded in prayer, a prayer for victory. And it starts in verse 1. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob set you securely on high. May he send you help from the sanctuary and support you from Zion. May he remember all your meal offerings and find your burnt offerings acceptable. Selah. May he grant your heart's desire and fulfill all your counsel. So we see here the people interceding with a great prayer for their king. May the Lord answer you, set you securely, send you, send you help, support you, remember your offerings, find them acceptable. May he give you your heart's desire and fulfill all your counsel, your purpose, your plans. What an example we get for the people praying for their leader. These Israelites are on their knees on behalf of their king. It makes me think, well, well, what about us? Do we intercede on behalf of the leader of our country? You know, it's easy to pray for the president when he's doing something you agree with, isn't it? But what about when he's doing something you don't agree with? Or if he's not in line with your political views? It's kind of hard then, isn't it? But that's probably when we should be praying the most for him. You know, it doesn't matter what party line the president is. They all do things that we don't agree with or things that we can bash them for. They're humans, you know, they mess up. You know, well, think about this. What if instead of talking bad about the president, about what he's doing or not doing, what if we just used that same amount of time and prayed for him? So instead of engaging in a slam session for five minutes, we take that same five minutes and pray, still devoting the same time to the guy, but in a much more powerful way. I mean, really, what, what's going to be more productive, us complaining about the guy or us praying for him? Just like the Israelites lifted up David to God. He said, they said, Lord, answer him in the day of trouble. Send him help from your sanctuary. May his offering be acceptable to you. Could you imagine how much time the country spends collectively complaining about the president on a daily basis? What if we all pray? That would be a lot of prayer, wouldn't it? Well, what if someone comes up to us and starts complaining about him? You know, did you hear what the president did now? Did you see the news? You could say, well, you know, that sounds bad. Why don't we pray for him? It would be a lot of prayer, wouldn't it? Probably may overload the uh, servers in heaven and kick us offline. I don't know. but uh, So we see the people, as they go from interceding on behalf of their king to verse 5, We will sing for joy over your victory. And in the name of our God, we will set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. So what confidence in the Lord. They're already planning a victory party. And the overhead banner reads, good job, King David. Right? No. It it reads, Yahweh. In the name of our God, we will set up banners. So you see, because they lifted David up to the Lord, they give the credit to the Lord for his victory. What name is on the banners that we fly? Do we give credit? Who do we give credit to? Our country, our political party, our company, our hobby, our church. These things can all be great. The first our, uh, Colossians 3.17 tells us, Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. So whenever we talk about or whatever we do, we need to fly the banner of God, of Jesus. 
We need to do it in His name. And if it's something we can't talk about or do in His name, under His banner, then we shouldn't be doing it. Verse 6 tells us, Now I know that the Lord saves His anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Some boast in chariots and some in horses, but we will boast in the name of the Lord our God. They have bowed down and fallen, but we have risen and stood upright. Save, O Lord. May the king answer us in the day we call. So some trust in chariots and horses, but we will trust in the name of the Lord. Well, what does the world put trust in? They put trust in militaries and governments, don't they? But we see David here. He has been putting his trust in the Lord his whole life. Even as a boy when he braved Goliath with no armor, no sword, just trusting in the Lord. You know, Goliath was this military superpower in that day. He was enormous, strong. He had state-of-the-art armors and weapons. No one in their right mind would have put their money against him. But to God, Goliath's power was nothing, and David knew it. It's easy to put our trust in the things of this world, but the world will let us down. So just like these saints of old, let's put our trust in the name of God. Psalm 21. Psalm 21 is real similar to Psalm 20. Some feel it may be the song of victory and thankfulness after the battle for which they prayed in Psalm 20. We'll see how David rejoices in the Lord with this overwhelming victory. David is also encouraged as he anticipates future victories by the power of God. For the choir director, Psalm of David, verse 1. O Lord, in your strength the king will be glad. And in your salvation, how greatly he will rejoice. You have given him his heart's desire, and you have not withheld the request of his lips. Selah. You have met him with blessings of good things. You set a crown of fine gold on his head. He asked life of you. You gave it to him. Length of days forever and ever. His glory is great through your salvation. Splendor and majesty you place on him. For you make, him, you make him most blessed forever. You make him joyful with gladness in your presence. For the king trusts in the Lord, and through the loving kindness of the Most High, he will not be shaken. So we see David rejoicing in past victories. David is speaking of his, himself in the third person here. Then who does he credit the victory to? Well, let's look at it again. He says, O Lord, in your strength, the king will be glad. And in your salvation, how greatly he will rejoice. You have given him his heart's desire. And you have not withheld your request of his lips. For you met him with blessing of good, the blessings of good things. You set the crown of fine gold on his head. He asked life of you and you gave it to him. Length of days forever and ever. His glory is great through your salvation. Splendor and majesty you placed upon him. For you made him most blessed forever. You make him joyful with gladness and in your presence. For the king trusts in the Lord. And through the loving kindness of the Most High, he will not be shaken. So often we petition God for something and then we forget to praise him. To give him the credit that he deserves. Not David here. He gives all the glory to God. David had a lot of accomplishment. A lot of things he could have taken credit for. To take pride in. But he put the credit where it belongs. What a great example this is for us. Well now we see David look into future victories in verse 8. Your hand will find out all your enemies. Your right hand will find out those who hate you. You will make them as a fiery oven in the time of your anger. The Lord will swallow them up with his wrath. The fire and fire will devour them. 
their offspring you will destroy from the earth and their descendants from among the sons of men. Though they intended evil against you and devised a plot, they will not succeed. For you will make them turn their back. You will aim with your bowstrings at their faces. Oh, to be the enemy of God. What a dismal place to be. Could you imagine having God aiming an arrow at your face? Could you imagine him having that bow pulled back, the hand of God, and this arrow? You know, have you ever seen one of those razor broadhead arrows just pointing right here in your face? Wow. And it's not a place that we want to be. We want to be standing behind the Lord, saying, verse 13, Be exalted, O Lord, in your strength. We will sing and praise your power. Amen. God is so powerful. We do not want to be his enemy. Psalm 22. Psalm 22 speaks of Jesus. Even though it was penned by David 1,000 years before Jesus, several hundred years before the idea of the crucifixion was even invented by the Romans. Yet it reads like an eyewitness account of Jesus dying on the cross. David was writing about a difficult experience he had that sort of paralleled this future experience that Jesus had. So there are two meanings to this psalm. The superscription says, For the choir director, upon... Ahijaleth Hasharhar, Hashahar, which literally means the dawning of the day. So this was to be sung at daybreak. It's a psalm of David. Verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I have no rest. Jesus quotes this psalm in Matthew 27, verses 45 and 46. Now from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So at the ninth hour, the sun comes back out and Jesus cries out to the Father while he hung there from the cross. Jesus was temporarily forsaken by God while our sin was upon him. God turned his head away from Jesus. And Jesus quoted this cry of abandonment for those that were there. That they might look it up and see what was going on. Back then, it was common for rabbis to quote the beginning of a passage intending for their students to search it out. And so Jesus quotes this psalm for us. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And then Isaiah 59.2 But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. This separation is the forsaking that Jesus is talking about. This is when he was was sweating blood over in the garden. This is what he was sweating blood over in the garden. You remember as he prayed that night before. And and his prayer was so earnest, there was drops of blood coming from him. It was not the physical pain that he would endure that he was so concerned with, but this temporary separation from God, this spiritual separation from the Father. So he's crying out to the Father, Why have you forsaken me? I cry and you don't answer. I have no rest. And then in verse 3, he says, Yet you are holy, 
O you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel, in you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried out and were delivered. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. What a confident confession of trust. All this is going on and he says, yet you are holy. He goes on in verse 6. But I am a worm and not a man, a reproach of men and despised by people. All who see me sneer at me. They separate with their lips. They wag their heads saying, commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver you. Let him rescue you because he delights in him. David felt like a worm as he was going through this time. He saw others mock him and ridicule him, just as Jesus experienced this on the cross in Matthew 27, 39 through 42. It says, and those those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from that cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him and saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself, he's the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross and they will believe him. It's still the same way today. The strongest opposition to the work of God is from the religious work of man. I can't even imagine all that Jesus had gone through and was going through, and the very people that bore God's name are mocking him. How did he restrain himself? In just a blink of an eye, he could have been standing on the ground, completely restored, with a thousand crosses around him, bearing these mockers. But God is so long-suffering. He just endured it. This word used for worm is taloth, and it's also translated as crimson. And the reason is um, these worms, they would extract a red dye by crushing them, which is just kind of interesting. So this juice down here that we're going to partake of in a little bit, This represents how Jesus was crushed like a worm to extract his blood to wash away our sin. Verse 9. Yet you are he who brought me forth from the womb. You made me trust upon my mother's breast. Upon you I was cast from birth. You have been my God from my mother's womb. David expresses his relationship with the Lord. And David saw God's hand in his life from the beginning. Just as Jesus, as a baby, was so dependent on the Father. You know, we don't often think about Jesus as dependent upon the Father like we are. But he was. Philippians 2, 5 through 8 tell us, Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. So we see that Jesus was fully God and fully man, dependent upon the Father, just as we are. Verse 11, be not far from me, for trouble is near. There is none to help. Many bowls have surrounded me. Strong bowls of Basham have encircled me. They open wide their mouth at me as a rage, raging, raving and they roaring lion. There was none to help him. He was deserted. 
Do you remember who's described as as a roaring lion in Scripture? In 1 Peter 5.8, it tells us, Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So Jesus sees this roaring lion there. And also these bowls of Bashan. John Corson comments, Worshipped by the Canaanites, the bowls of Bashan and Gilead represented demonic entities. Therefore, I believe that as he hung on the cross, Jesus was not only surrounded by people who mocked him, but by demons who also jeered and taunted. Again, the long-suffering of God to endure that. Verse 14. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within me. When a person was crucified, hanging there on the cross, they would have to hold themselves up. Like a gymnast, you know, holds themselves on those rings with their arms, the strength of their arms, in order to breathe freely. You see, once their arms fatigued and they can no longer hold their weight and they hung there from them, they're unable to exhale. So they would lift, you know, once their arms are fatigued, they would lift by pushing off on that nail through the foot. Just, you know, all the weight of their body is being pushed from that wound on top of that nail just to take a breath. And, of course, this would go on for hours until that body was just so fatigued that there's no, they just couldn't do it anymore or they would just finally suffocate. That's why when the Romans wanted to speed things up, they would break the legs of the victim, causing them to suffocate that much sooner. The other cause of death from crucifixion was when the heart muscle would rupture, as we see in the case of Jesus. You see, the excruciating pain and this physical exertion of just holding yourself up and lifting yourself up, it would cause your pulse to devil, to really increase. Your heart is really pumping. And, of course, uh, we see this huge loss of blood that Jesus experienced with the scourging, and that would cause his blood pressure to drop. So now he has this heart racing with no blood, not enough blood to pump through it. And uh, that would cause the heart to literally rupture, just to burst open. And so we see when the soldier pierced Jesus with his spear, he lacerated the pericardium. That's this membrane that surrounds the heart. And there's a, there was a visible amount of water and blood that rushed out. And that indicates that his heart was ruptured. And though all co- commonly it's said that Jesus died from a broken heart, It wasn't the emotional stress cannot cause your heart to rupture like that. It can cause it to stop, but not to rupture. And you hear about that old couples that have been married for 40 years and the one passes away and the other one just just dies a day later. Um, You know, they say from a broken heart. That's from the heart stopping. In this case, his heart ruptured from the physical stress of enduring that he endured for this excruciating form of execution. Verse 15, my strength is dried up like a pot sheared and my tongue cleaves to my jaws and you lay me in the dust of the death of death for dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers have encompassed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I cannot count all my bones. I can count all my bones. They look, they stare at me. They divide my garments among them and my clothing. They cast lots. Again, this was written a thousand years before Jesus. It's amazing. So we see even more prophecy fulfilled by Jesus. His bones were not broken, which also, by the way, met the requirements of the Passover lamb spelled out in Exodus chapter 12. We see in Matthew 27, 35, And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among themselves by casting lots. 
another small but amazing prophecy fulfilled. Well, David, he's sharing this experience that he had in words. And God guided David's words to tell specific details of the experience that the Messiah would go through. David's hands were not pierced, as far as we know. But God God guided him to relate what he was feeling to that image. God can even use our bad experiences for astounding things, just like he did with David. Verse 19. But you, O Lord, be not afar off. Be not far off. O you, my help, hasten to my assistance. Deliver my soul from the sword, my only life from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth. So we see a final call for deliverance. How many times in the Psalms does David look to God for his strength? He's constantly looking to the Lord. If you feel that life is too much for you, that you don't have the strength to deal with it, well, join the club. You're not alone. God doesn't expect us to have the strength to deal with what life brings to us we need to fight the battle but we need to rely upon god for the strength to do the fighting when we are weak in ourselves we are strong in the lord the way that david walked with god is a small picture of how jesus walked with the father he goes on in 21 From the horns of the wild oxen you answer me. I will tell of your name to my brethren, and in the midst of your assembly I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him, all you descendants of Jacob. Glorify him and stand in awe of him, all you descendants of Israel, for he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him, he helped. When he cried to him for help, he heard. So what, so what happened here that we see the switch from petition to praise? From crying out to God to rejoicing in him. He says, but when he cried to him for help, he heard. God heard. And so we see this ultimate answer of victory. We don't know the details of David's situation. But we know he was delivered from it. However, we do know the details of Jesus' situation. And he was delivered in victory with the resurrection. Praise God. He goes on in verse 25. From you comes my praise in the great assembly. I shall pay my vows before those who fear him. The afflicted will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nation will worship before you. For the kingdom is the Lord's and he rules over the nations. Verse 29, all the prosperous of the earth will eat and worship. All those who go down to the dust will bow before him. Even he who cannot keep his soul alive, posterity will serve him. He will, hold, he, he will be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They will come and they will declare his righteousness to a people who will be born that he has performed it. So this prophecy continues on into the millennial reign of Christ on earth. It says, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess the name of the Lord. Like we've said before, God does not believe in atheists. It's just a matter of time. And unfortunately, those that wait and do not believe here on earth by faith, it'll be too late for them. He says, 
It'll be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They will come and will declare his righteousness to a people who will be born, that, ha- that he has performed it, or that he has accomplished it. That is what Jesus declared when he gave up his spirit. Do you remember? He said, it is finished. It's accomplished. It's done. It's paid in full. It's complete. Dylan, would you come up? We normally have uh, someone else come up and lead us in communion, but because of uh, we just happened to end on Psalm 22 today, I just thought we would just uh, go from go right from there. Um, as Dylan plays, guys, just just take some time and pray. Uh, ask God for forgiveness of your sins. Remember what He did. Remember that He was crushed like a worm. That this. His blood was extracted for us. He said to take those things, to take that wafer, to take that juice in remembrance of him. And not just in remembrance of what he did, what he went through, this excruciating thing, but remember why he did it. Why did the Lord do that? He did it for us. He did it because he loves us. He did it willingly. From the beginning of time, before we were even created, he knew he would have to do this. Remember how much God loves us, how much he was willing to endure for us. While we were yet sinners, he died for us. So after, you, after you've prayed, come, just come down this aisle, grab a cup and a wafer. They're, in the, they're stacked together. And just go back to your seats and or you can come up to the altar here and take it you can take it with your family you can take it on your own and just let me pray with you real quick Lord we thank you so much for what you've done for us your love your long suffering is so great father we cannot ask for a greater lord a greater savior Help us, Lord, as we just pour out our hearts to you right now, that we just would be honest with you, Lord, that you, we would just, that we would just ask for your help, that you would just speak to our hearts, and that you would just renew us, Lord, renew us with your spirit as we do this in remembrance of you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.